Hello, everybody. I'm Bob Couture, host of Where the Twain Meet. Welcome to our series of chats and interviews that I hope will shed new light on the subject of dispute resolution, areas where our human competitive and cooperative impulses, the core elements of conflict, are melded together into alloys of behavior that may not always prove predictable. We'll look in places where you'd expect the subject to be examined, but also perhaps where you might not. Our agreements, truces, deals, legal judgments, alliances, bonds of love, victories, losses, even works of art, created by some magical alchemy? Or are there real axioms, proven methods, which guide us through the churn of conflict to meaningful resolution? I think about Rodney King's simple plea during the 1992 Los Angeles protest riots. Can we all get along? Can we all get along? That wasn't just a question. It was a proposition too. Is that proposition impossible to achieve or even ridiculous to seriously consider? Let's talk with folks who may tell us something that we don't know. And let's try to find more answers. Of course, like many good things in life, some of the remedies are probably in plain sight. But on this show, we'll do our best to probe ideas simple and complex and not look the other way. After a successful career as a musician and businessman, Jeff Boone founded the Shining Light Organization in a rural Pennsylvania church based on a simple theory of change. When incarcerated individuals are equipped with the tools, perspectives, and skills that allow them to meet their core needs in positive ways, an individual becomes capable of being a successful and productive member of society. Jeff is committed to the idea that by helping individuals in prison to thrive, by giving them the tools, motivation, and support every human being needs to become the most productive, resilient, hopeful version of themselves, Shining Light will have a profoundly positive impact on individual lives, families, and extended communities. And that theory has been borne out by the dramatic success of participants in the Shining Light program, who, among other positive developments, have an extremely low reincarceration rate. Jeff has developed working relationships with over 70 prisons and jails in 22 states and Puerto Rico. His passion is to see oppressed or neglected people have the opportunity to develop their unrealized potential. Dorman Lisby served 25 years and eight months in the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. He was released from prison in 2022. He came to know Shining Light when he participated in a workshop at SCI Frackville and began serving on the Shining Light theater team. While incarcerated, he was a deacon in the church, an avid weightlifter, a teacher's assistant in the education department, and a certified peer support specialist. Balancing mind, body, and spirit was very important to him during his time in prison. Since returning home to Philadelphia, Dorman has started working as a handyman and floor technician, participating in church and going to the gym are part of his regular activities. Although he remains on parole, he has managed to fulfill some of the things on his bucket list, such as going to Disney World, visiting Bourbon Street in New Orleans, and taking his family to King's Dominion in Virginia. Dorman also volunteers at churches to feed the homeless and to work with children. He plans to matriculate into college to study rehabilitation health systems and computer technology. Travis Boone is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania's Master's in Applied Positive Psychology program and holds a BS in Business Administration from Colorado State University. His career has focused on social justice, specifically in the areas of international development, homelessness, and quality food access. He's worked with Shining Light in a variety of ways since 2007, including the implementation of the Monitoring and Evaluation Framework. Currently, he is developing and implementing new programs that use the field of positive psychology to support the incarcerated community. 
I'm pleased to introduce to you the folks from Shining Light and hope you enjoy our discussion today about where the twain meet. Jeff and Dorman and Travis, welcome to the show. I'm so pleased to be able to talk with you today. The subject of the United States prison system is complicated and downright haunting and can't be overlooked, but I think there's a tendency for those of us outside the prison walls to do just that. I was checking some numbers recently. Though the United States has 4% of the world's population, it houses 20% of the global prison population. As of 2021, 1.8 million people were incarcerated and an additional 5.4 million were under correctional supervision, that is probation or parole. Those are staggering numbers. I've read on your website that 68% of people released from prison in the United States will be reincarcerated within three years, 83% within nine years. And we know that the prison system is disproportionately weighted with persons of color and people with scant economic means. Jeff, what is going on and how is Shining Light, the organization that you founded, meeting the lives of incarcerated people behind the prison walls. Obviously, the correctional system is not quite achieving its goals of sending people back into society ready to be successful citizens. And there's been many efforts, particularly in the past decade or two, uh, an increased awareness of the facts that you just said. But then what do we do about it? What we find is a missing link. We see a lot of emphasis on getting people jobs, getting people vocational training, ideally getting them housing and transportation and education. But the very basics of how do I thrive in life are often neglected inside and the environment is not one that's conducive to building people up that they can succeed in jobs, maintaining housing, and so forth when they get out. So we bring some of those very basic life skills and tools for people to be successful. Uh, We found the field of positive psychology, which really doesn't focus on what's wrong with someone because Our focus is on how do we take someone and build them up, that they can thrive. And we'll use decades of research that's been done in positive psychology that identifies what are the essentials for people to thrive. And we provide those tools in our programming. So prison authorities control the flow of essential staples of life to the incarcerated people. How much does competition for scarce resources define the social conditions among incarcerated persons? I think your question's really good. Using the term essentials for life is one of the shortcomings we see in the system is we think of essentials for life as those physical things. We need food, we need water, we need shelter. But reality is there's other essentials for life. And those include safety and connection and self-efficacy, a variety of things that are overlooked in our system. There's a scarcity and it's a whole different world inside. It's as different from our basic daily outside society as it might be going to remote part of Africa to go inside a prison. It's a different culture. It's a different economy in there. So it functions like society does, but in different ways because of the scarcity of things, but particularly the scarcity of some of those soft things is huge and very neglected. They're human beings like anyone else. Do you feel that scarcity that's essentially being doled out by the correctional officers 
Do you feel that that affects them as humans? The correctional officers? Yes. 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 The environment is a negative one based on security overall. And with a mindset of isolation and punishment in general. So that is not a place where anyone, any human being is going to thrive. Statistics for correctional officers, when you get into PTSD and suicide and mental health issues, the only comparable group really is people returning from combat. It's really a poor environment to work in and to live in. Do you find that you're working with them as well in your program? Directly or indirectly. We have to work with them to get in. And there's many good people working inside, but the system and the environment is not conducive to supporting that very well. So we do work with them and they sit in currently in our sessions and we see changes in them as we work too positive changes. In what way? What do you see? <laughs> Travis might be a better one to Travis or Dorman answer that question. They are sitting in the classes and have observed directly. We typically have champions that are correction staff that kind of are liaison and really help with the system that we're working in because each prison we're working with is pretty unique um, in order to get participation participants, participation happening in different programs and all, all the like. One thing we try to do is try to have that be as um, strong of a relationship as possible, both because that's how we're able to continue working with them as long as that stays positive. Also, as a way to support them in the work that they're doing. Oftentimes, to bring our programs in, there might be a little bit of extra work on their end that they have to do that pays off in the long run. But in the immediate, they might have to put something else to the side to make it happen. So we really want to encourage them and make it as easy as possible for them to be able to make the programs happen. I think the change I've seen in a few of those champions that we've gotten to work with is just more engagement actually within the groups unexpectedly um, and how that engagement has changed. And maybe initially working with certain champions, they would insert their opinion, um, oftentimes in a more combative tone as a way to express their thoughts in a way of how people should live their lives. And I've seen that language change from being much more directive, I know you don't, to one that is much more focused on um, this is how I've seen it, and or just encouraging the group to keep working through the content, keep working through the program in a way for them to see that they get the most out of it. So I've been going into jails and prisons since I was 14 with Shining Light in different capacities. Our focus has been to work with the folks who are incarcerated However, I've always been told, make sure you smile at everyone. And part of that is because everyone there is working through something, probably, as all humans are, but I think especially in this environment where it's a little bit more heightened. And I think emotions are contagious, both positive and negative. And so as a way to shine a light in a dark place, that was one simple thing that we always did and something that I know I continue to do and our team continues to do very intentionally. And we see a huge need and way to serve the correctional community as well as to bring more formal programming and opportunities and support to correctional staff as well. That's definitely something Shining Light has talked about doing and wants to do more intentionally instead of it being a byproduct of the programs we're offering to the incarcerated community, um, but dir to directly target and work with and support the correctional staff as well. That's something that keeps coming up too um, because it's, it really highlights how this environment isn't really working for anyone whether staff, people who are employed there, folks who are incarcerated, and I think taxpayers as well, um, not seeing that money being used as best as it could be. Travis, earlier, did you use the term champions? Yes. Could you talk more about that? Yeah, so we will have designated staff people um, within individual facilities that we refer to as champions. And so then they would champion the programs that are coming into the facility from Shining Light. So whether that's our Loop magazine, getting subscriptions out, getting bulk copies, which are copies that are sent for use throughout the prison, um, or for getting any of our classes going for the programs that we're offering. They're a staff member, sometimes in education, sometimes in the activities department, sometimes through different departments, depending on what fits for the facility. They're our point of contact. 
every prison is like a huge system. For an outsider, I think like a school system is maybe a close comparison. There's so many moving parts. So it's really helpful to have one person who we're able to communicate with in order to be able to really champion the program and to make things happen. Dormant is so much of the lived experience in social organizations relates to who's in and who's out. It seems to me that prisons are no different. What's it like being inside those walls? And then what's it like to be outside now with family and friends? To be inside is difficult in itself, just to be separated. I always tell people that the loneliest, crowded place I've ever been. Most crowded, but loneliest, I should say. In that everyone is a stranger, but you don't know where they come from, different backgrounds. You don't know what they're in for. You don't know what their intent is and in trying to befriend you. So everyone comes in with, the, with their guard up. And then you have the myths set in place through the media or books and things about prison by people who probably have never been in prison. That whole idea of what prison is portrayed in a false way. And I have to say, the longer I stayed, the more comfortable I became with the environment and the people around me, but not with being in prison. Home, I love home. I don't know how people go back. I don't know what dynamic is placed in their lives wherein they face recidivism. I wouldn't trade this for anything, freedom. I wouldn't trade this for anything. Could you talk a little bit about the social structure of the world, where you live for being incarcerated? Let me say this first. Travis alluded it to prison being uh, likened to a school system. And the idea of who's in and who's out in school, who's the, the cool guys, that's a humanity thing. That's a, a people thing. It's the same principles inside. But to speak to where I grew up at, my home was a safe place to be. My mother, she provided as best as she could being a single parent. However, she couldn't be home and work at the same time. She worked from sun up to sundown. Rarely did I get a chance to see my mother because of how hard she worked and provided. And that's how she expressed her love by providing. It wasn't a physical, I love you or anything like that. I, I understood that she loved me through those things that she did and providing. But to step outside of my door wasn't the safest place to be. Yeah, it may have been safe from the corner of my street to the end of my street. You're talking about row home. I'm from Philadelphia. And it was a tight-knit community, but it just wasn't safe. You go to the corner, you have people living the lives of the underworld. I don't know how to, uh, because recognizing it now, I know that it was bad, but then it was normal. So that I didn't see the error in the ways of the people who were providing the best way they could as fathers to the children by selling drugs or doing whatever they did to... Uh, provide for their families. I didn't see it as a bad thing then. I just looked at it as a means to provide. Did you feel that to make money that way was a meaningful option given the choices for the guys at the time? I, I believe it was because we're not talking about an evolutionary change. We're talking about a revolutionary change. It was immediate. Access to the cash was immediate. People didn't trust in the banks. People didn't trust in societies, uh, the way they set up banking and that whole thing. I come from where people will hit their money in their beds and, and you go to your grandparents' house, the money was still placed in books <laughs> and, and things of that nature. It's nice to go into my grandparents' house because that's how I became a good reader because I picked up a book and I said, oh, it's $10 in here. I get $10 for reading this book. <laughs> But you didn't trust in the institutions of what society put in place for banking, for education, for anything. Not when I was a kid. So it was somewhat of a survival instinct 
in a world that you didn't trust. Absolutely. We made the best with what we had. As a history of the people in my culture, the black culture, African-American culture, whatever you want to call it, we took with what was given to us and made the best of it. We weren't given the best parts of the pig. I don't eat pork, but we made the best of what was provided for us. And that mindset continued on for generations and generations. So you find yourself in prison. Yes. And you mentioned that at some point you became more comfortable in the environment. Was it frightening at first? And then what changed for you? It never stopped being frightening because you never knew what the next day held. And it wasn't necessarily frightening because of the interaction with my peers, the inmates. You know, that power dynamic is in place. These are guards and these are inmates. Sometimes the guards are more volatile than the inmates, unfortunately. So the frightening part never ceased in that I hope to go home one day and this guard may have been having a bad day one day and fabricated a story against me, gave me a write-up, put me in the RHU, which is commonly known as the hole, and my chances of going home has been lessened that much more. The frightening part wasn't so much as physical as it was mental. When I first went in, it was about the physical fear. Who would I have to fight? I didn't go to prison for selling Girl Scout cookies. I caused harm to a family. I victimized somebody's family member, unfortunately. And whatever happened between he and I that day, ultimately, I take responsibility for my part in the act of whatever happened. However, people were angry with me. They probably still are. I had to be concerned about that. Revenge, that whole dynamic. Inside prison, you don't have the guns or the knives or the bats and sticks and or a squad. It doesn't start off like that. I went in alone. Most of my friends went to school and, and did the right things eventually. <laughs> and a lot of that was because of my going to prison. I changed the dynamic in their lives and they seen how real it was. But the fear transfers from a physical to a mental fear. The enemy or the opposition, I will say, it's no longer your peer, it's the staff, unfortunately. So when you mention fear of revenge, is that inside the walls? Absolutely. Absolutely. Living with that kind of consciousness, how does that affect how you interact with other incarcerated folks or prison staff? How does your person change in that social environment? There's no trust. No one's your friend. Camaraderie is something that came later on as far as people I dealt with. And just that, that fear is just the possibility that this person, remember, I don't know all of his family members. I don't know that dynamic, who's friends with this person and, and that whole mindset. So is the camaraderie that you established centered around safety and survival, or are you able to have relationships that have nothing to do with that at this time in your prison experience? In the beginning, I didn't want any friends. I was isolated. I walked alone, although I was willing to help people, assist people. I always had family support. I've been fortunate in that aspect. My family has stood by my side from day one. I didn't have to worry about fending for or fighting for commissary or getting food products or getting my hygiene gear and equipment, stuff like that, to keep my wellness and, and as far as my physical health off the par. So I didn't have to lean on a comrade or a friend during that part of my time in prison. What's it like in solitary confinement? What does that do to you? Talk about what it does to the brain. Isolation in itself. I'm talking about a person who just lives and at home or just stuck in Alaska for a certain amount of times, eight months, give it, without no interaction with other people, without no human contact. It affects the parts of the brain that controls your emotions 
in your thinking, your critical thinking. It causes the brain to atrophy. What would be an example of a kind of thought pattern that you might develop from being alone like that? It lessens your social skills. For an example, I was a certified peer support specialist. And my duty was to go around the RHU and talk to guys on a daily basis to check to see if they're okay. Because the suicide rate in the RHU are much higher than those are in general population. And then you had guys that are on restricted release meaning that they are sentenced to do whole time. They're never going to interact with a person outside of a guard tethering them and having that type of contact with them, patting them down in hopes of trying to help a person reenter society because these, some of these people are going home. We can't have them go home straight from the hole, straight to society. There'll be a detriment to themselves, to society and, and everything around them, I believe. After experience in the hole, I met a guy, I'm not going to say his name, and I was asked to introduce him to general population. General population is amongst everyone else. And when he came out, he would walk with his head down and his hands behind his back as if he had handcuffs on because he had been in a hole for 10 years. I would introduce him to eating at a table with another person. He would not look me in my face. He would not look up. I gave him a hug and he almost, and this is a big man. He didn't know how to react or respond to human touch. Other than being tethered, the tether around his waist and handcuffed all the time. He's walking like this. So I'm telling him it's okay to put your hands to the front now. I have to remind him that it's okay. I had to think about the physical effects on his legs. He couldn't walk far because... He couldn't hold his body up because it's the space that he was able to walk in was smaller than most people's bathrooms. So to take a long walk was difficult. And this is not an old man. This is not an older gentleman, I must say. Look me in my eyes. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay to shake my hand. This is what men do. This is what we do. He had to relearn how to interact with people. So we're sending this person straight from the RHU hole to his family, where we're already considered different or weirdos because of our being incarcerated for so long. And now this person's going home and he has no interaction other than his food being slid through a door. Yeah. I don't know, Bob. It's, pre it's pretty damaging. It messes with a person's critical thinking. You don't trust anybody. And what do you expect from a person like that? What do we expect from a person like that? How many people did you know who were in a similar circumstance? Unfortunately, too many. One is too many. One is too many. Unfortunately, Bob, the reality of it is you don't really have to do anything to go to the hole. If a guard is having a bad day or he feels like you disrespected him some type of way, then he has that, that, that weapon. It's used as a weapon to punish guys. A lot of guys. A lot of guys. How do you... How do you define hope? Fortunately, the person that I was telling you about, he's home now. He's doing well because he was let out of the hole. He was given an opportunity to socialize. He had to learn how to, re to socialize himself. And his hope was to go home and just be normal and be seen as normal because he realized he wasn't normal just from being in prison. He was in prison inside a prison. So he was released from that prison back into regular prison or general population. And he's seen how different he was even from the, the people there. So imagine going from that step. His hope was, and I can speak for him because I had this conversation with him. It was, it was my honor to help re-socialize this person. And I don't take any credit because he did all the work. 
he wanted this. He had a desire to be normal and, and seen as normal because whatever he had done, I don't think warranted him being in the hole that long. I didn't know the specifics of, as to why he was placed there. And it may not have even been him. He might have been in, in part of a group of guys and was picked off because of one person that he hung with. That he considered a friend. He held the virtues of not telling on his friend or something like that. But the hope is to be normal, to be seen as normal to be matriculated back into society as a human being and be seen as a human being, as a person, not as a number, not as a person who maybe 30 years ago did something that changed his life and the lives of other people. And it's very unfortunate. And it doesn't excuse the act that caused a person to be in prison. But a person doesn't stay like that. And the hope is to be a part of your family. The hope is to live what everyday red-blooded Americans live. I don't have the biggest house or have the fanciest car, but I have a home. I have heat. I have love here. I have a vehicle, praise God. And that's the hope. That's the hope. Dorman, do you see scenarios where someone comes to prison not violent, uh, but becomes violent as a result of the treatment. And, and I think one time in a conversation, you had distinguished to me the difference between violent act and a violent person. What's going on with this? Fear. 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 Uh, unfortunately, some guys might come in um, because there are predators there. Pray on the week. That's reality. That's reality. And guys who have considered predatorial acts, that's a whole nother type of violence to me. That's a different type of mindset. And I'm not trying to stigmatize people who've committed predatorial acts. That's, that's a whole nother type of issue, Bob. Even with them, I believe there's light at the end of the tunnel. I'm going to just say that. But a person who's been victimized and has experienced nothing but trauma going into prison and sometimes they become what you would deem as violent. But I see them as just being scared and afraid, not trusting, you know, being isolated, allowing these things to happen to their critical thinking parts of their brain that where the white matter is being wiped away that affects the way their emotions are, you know. That kind of thing. So it, I think it has more to do with their experience because of a lack of trust. Does that make sense? And so what you describe of occurrences in the prison itself by prison staff could be described as a kind of violence. Yes. And that violence is being used to hand out justice in the view of the prison personnel. Unfortunately, the sentence was handed down by the judge. It's not the guard's job or the staff members in the prison to hand down any type of punitive anything. Their job is custody care and, and prevention. That says that on, well, at least in Pennsylvania, under their keystone, this is their mission statement. Care, custody, and protection. They're not judge, jury, and that kind of thing. They, they're not there to hand down punishment. Yet they do it. And, and unfortunately, those guys, like Jeff said, something about them having PTSD coming out of, out of the military. The prisoners ran like on a military time. Most of the guards are ex-military and they're coming from places where they're trained that if you're not with us, you're against us. And it doesn't stop. And it doesn't stop. They create a camaraderie and a bond that they come in with whether it's the military or whether they grew up together, whether their, their parents were, their legacy guards. His father, his grandfather's grandfather were all guards, prison guards. 
<laughs> so they're groomed in this way to think this way in an archaic way that doesn't have to be and shouldn't be. Because if I commit a crime, there's a judicial system in place to say whether or not I'm convicted and given a sentence in prison. I'm not to go to prison and be penalized any more than what was handed down to me by the judge and jury, a jury of my peer. Yet they do it. Awful. Jeff and Travis, what's it like being an outsider to the prison walls, trying to break in with your thoughts and feelings and the social strategies that you believe would be beneficial inside? I would start that it took me a long time to really comprehend what was going on inside. And you're never really, there's always some difference between you and people who are incarcerated. And there's a reality you get to walk out the door. Now, with that said, I've spent 24 years going into prisons all over the United States. During that time, going in most of those years, viewed as a volunteer by the prison, welcomed as a volunteer in theory, but the reality of trying to bring something good to the incarcerated, the systemic walls to preventing good things from happening the lack of resources for enabling good things to happen inside was pretty overwhelming much of the time. So I think I started to relate more and more to people inside about what it means for things to be out of your control. Things are run in a way that is challenging to live and work in. And Years of doing that, years of working and being alongside of people who are incarcerated gave me a, an ongoing broadening of my understanding of what it's like to be in there. And it didn't take long till I realized they're human beings just like me. So it was relatively easy to start to relate as that reality set in. And the more I worked alongside of them, the more I realized exactly that. They're human beings like me. And it became very easy to work alongside of people who are incarcerated. It was surprising how wise and joyful they could be. And that made it very easy. But the walls to get inside of prison are as big as the walls for somebody inside to get out. And that is just a constant reminder. Jeff, what is the essence of what you do that brings this other social grace, essentially, to people who are on the inside? And why would they trust you? Whenever we go in, and this is how we select our staff and how we constantly train and reinforce each other and our staff, you have to constantly have the mindset that these are human beings just like you. But for a bad choice, a mistake along the way, and regardless of what that is, that doesn't matter to us. These are human beings with the same needs as I have. And what we've seen is you can walk into a group of incarcerated people, and I would say in 30 to 60 seconds, they've pretty much sized you up and decided, hey, this person, I'm willing to uh, listen. I'm willing to put some trust in. I think he respects me or not. And it doesn't really matter exactly what you say because I'm often an awkward speaker, but they can read who you are underneath the words, underneath the facade we live with outside many times. Uh, they're really good at reading people. And uh, if you approach it, hey, we're all human beings. I've never had any problem relating to people inside at all, regardless of 
racial, socioeconomic, all kinds of barriers that seem to exist. They can go away very quick. In terms of some of the programming that you bring that you share with the population, it's based in the arts, in narrative, in naming, is that correct? We do use the arts as a tool. A lot of our programming is strength-based programming, helping people identify what their strengths are and how to build on them, how to notice and identify strengths in other people, which does a lot to help build empathy and start to build connection and the ability to develop relationships. And one of the most powerful tools we use is we start our sessions with what went right since the last time we met. And in a prison, the first answer you get is, this is prison, nothing went right. And then you ask, okay, let's talk about that. And one of the tools we use, especially now that we're doing more coarse kind of work, is we have formerly incarcerated individuals always on our facilitation team, and they're with us. They're easy to lean on. They've been there. And you can say, what went right? And they say, nothing. I say, well, you got up this morning, didn't you? Well, yeah, I guess that went right. And as people start to do that regularly, they start to realize that there's more to be grateful for than we often notice, whether we're outside or whether we're inside. And people develop gratefulness for the little good things that happen to us every day. And this applies to people outside as, as well as inside. We can overlook those little good things that make our lives meaningful and good and just dig ourselves in a negative hole. Or we can notice those things and build a mindset of gratefulness. As we do that, it's pretty surprising how things can build in a good way. So those are some of the things we use the arts. We have a character development, creative writing program, which actually has a lot of aspects of building mindfulness in it. We have a playwriting part of our courses that is really good at building teamwork among people who never worked together before. Uh, we have another aspect that builds resilience and plans for how to overcome obstacles in life variety of things like that. Would you say there's dignity in failure? Absolutely. And sometimes we would get three or four days in and a team had been working on writing a play they wanted to do. And we would read it and shake our heads and say, this just doesn't work. You have to start over. And it was hard to say that, but it was one of the best learning experiences they would have. Because that's the way life works sometimes. Other times we would try to do something with the group and it just wouldn't work. And we'd say, let's start again. And learning to overcome those challenges was one of the biggest learnings we could share. So it was almost good when something went wrong. One day we had a big full rehearsal day planned. We got to the prison. They said, ah, oh, we can't let you in today. We're locked down. Something happened on one of the blocks. You can't get in. We have a show to do in two days. It was a panic. So when we went in the next day, the men were panicked. What are we going to do? We, you know, we have all these people coming. We don't want them to laugh at us and we want to be ready. And we said, we're going to regroup. We're going to figure it out. We're going to make some changes and we'll be ready. Uh, one of the best preparations for life, because that's invariably what happens in life, especially in those intensive times when you walk out of the prison doors and you're trying to start over again. Things just go wrong. So if you can experience it, we like to call them intentional challenges. And unintentional challenges are really good too, because <laughs> That's just practice. So Travis, is there a data-driven science behind strategies of positive ecology in the prison? Um, yeah, I think there's definitely uh, a need for a lot more. 
Uh, but as far as different program iterations that take a strength-based approach or incorporate mindfulness or the arts or different positive interventions, there's a variety of research that supports it. Again, I think there's a huge need, which is something we're definitely looking to do and applying this field in corrections. Part of the application of positive psychology is always to have more science behind it and trying to understand how these efforts change. And my answer to that is yes. There's also the field of positive criminology, which is very much the intentional uh, application of positive psychology um, within prisons. And there's not a super clear definition for positive criminology, but it's a, a larger approach. Uh, that really looks to incorporate a strength-based approach, looking at resilience, looking at different positive interventions like meditation, mindfulness, yoga, things like that. That's been around since about 2010, I believe. Some of the criminologists really identified that as a need. And even when they were initially identifying that, it was pretty easy for them to pull from existing programs, things like the Good Lives model, that already had research supporting this positive behavior change approach. Um, and finding really positive outcomes in, in the data that they were finding. So if such restorative strategies are such a good idea, why would common strategies such as solitary confinement be so prevalent in U.S. prisons? Uh, I do think historical cultures are built into prisons. And changing culture in any institution is very difficult. We're dealing with that, and that is a whole lot of roots in politics, in spirituality, all kinds of reasons that we've evolved into the system we have today. And the ones controlling the system literally is society. Society elects legislatures who then fund and define laws and procedures and policies that dictate what the correctional system is going to be. And in a day of short bylines and easy answers, tough on crime really sells well. Negative news sells newspapers and gets viewers. So if there's a murder that happens, that's going to be front and center. There was recently an escapee from a local prison, and this was built up on the national news as there's a killer on the loose. And it's great for PR, but it dehumanizes that person. It dehumanizes the whole situation. And unless we take an overall look, do we want public safety and want to address all the layers that are involved in public safety? Or do we just want to say, lock him up? That's a bad guy. He's a killer for the rest of his life. Throw him in jail and forget about him and spend as little on him as you can. That sells a lot easier than the complex answers of dealing with human beings and all the trauma that's in lives. And what do you do? I think, Dorman, your comment about fear really applies here, too. And making changes in an environment where there's a lot on the line, there's a lot of people at stake, there's a lot of potential for negative stories to come out, all of these things, I think there's a lot of resistance to change. To take a different approach takes a lot of bravery and takes a lot of counter-cultural thinking based on the cultures that do exist. Going against the grain, what's that going to look like? Am I going to have the support to be able to do that? And it's not an environment that's going to allow for much failure or anything to go wrong. So I think there's kind of a system designed to not allow for um, change to happen quickly because of the fear that's there. And a lot of what we're bringing to the table from positive psychology was really uh, formed as a field in 1999. So few people that I interact with outside of work have any idea about what's going on in jails and prisons throughout the U.S. You see these stories, these extreme stories that happen. Um, but to really know the environment of a prison, until you go inside, it's really hard to experience or understand. So I think those environments are really complicated for everyone involved. How do we really come together as 
a society, as a community on local and a bigger scale to actually tackle this problem with understanding and not leaning into um, the worst case scenario and the fear. How do we approach it in a way that allows for human dignity and creativity to be expressed and for accountability and positive change to happen? To add validity to what Travis is saying in the macro, in the micro being inside, if a, if a staff member comes in, whether it's a guard or a treatment specialist, if they're kind to the inmates or to the residents or the incarcerated person, that person is ostracized by their peers. They're almost forced out of working in the prison because of, of fear, because people are content with the way they're ran. It's been like this for hundreds of years since probably the inception of what prison is. And what the Quakers came up with an idea of isolating the person and giving them a Bible, which is probably one of the most precious books on the God's creation and use it as a tool to suppress and oppress. I can't speak to it. This is the archaic thinking. There are models in place that people can go to and witness in other countries. And Travis could speak to that a little bit more than what I can. Mm -hmm the Norwegian way, Switzerland, the systems that are set up there and how they treat the incarcerated persons there is totally different than what this country does to Americans, ultimately. I know I'm asking this same question in a little bit of a different way, Dorman, but if it's true that socialization through cooperative work helps make people uh, who exit the prison system more self-reliant, and better citizens, why doesn't the prison system itself employ a similar method of rehabilitation? Well, Bob, that's the question we're still trying to figure out. You see the evidence, you see guys who've participated in Shine a Light, most of which do not return back to prison. This, this is a, a staff question that we discuss over and over again. Why won't they just accept it? Jeff works tirelessly in trying to present this to, to the masses or the people that he speak to in the prisons. He shows the evidence. We're not in the journals. We're not in the systems that are set up <laughs> that govern, that make the decisions of what's safe and what's unsafe and what's working and what's not working. We're, we don't have that right now, but we're working on that. And hopefully a light will be shined on those people and they'll see what we're doing at Shining Light truly does work. I'm a product of Shining Light. I can proudly say I met Jeff and I didn't meet Travis then while I was on the inside and he saw something in me that in essence, he helped to awaken. Yes, I was on my way in the process of changing the way I thought, the way I love myself. So it's no coincidence, no accident that we crossed one another's paths during that time. But to answer your question, we're still trying to figure out why are you not accepting the fact that people who are participating in these programs and the programs that you have in place ultimately don't work. A lot of those guys are come out of those groups more angry than they started the group. Frustrated that they're forced to do the group. Frustrated that if I don't take this group, I can't go home. Why, why are you holding this over my head as, a, again, another weapon, another a means to punish if I don't participate? All we want is freedom, <laughs> freedom of choice, freedom of ideas, freedom to have a voice. Shining Light provides a space that people are, a person can be vulnerable, cathartic, and grow. I've seen guys in, in 25 sessions or seven and a half weeks, I've seen them change, metamorphosis from a cowering, sad individual seeking hope turn into this bubbly cheerful bright person even expressing themselves just by flipping their head up that's a form of expression taking what you have and expressing yourself with it because everybody has on the same clothing or uniform but how you adorn it your frock says that i'm different and it speaks volumes of a person's character and, and, and who they're presenting themselves to be. They're taking care of themselves. They're hygiene and they're buttoning their clothes up. Things like that. 
things that I'm not going to say an untrained eye doesn't see. I recognize it <laughs> because like Jeff said, it, I picked up a skill. I can read a person in 30 seconds or less and know everything I need to know. And most importantly, whether I want to be around that person or not be around that person. Can I trust this person or not? Or am I willing to get this person a chance? Dorman, how is prison life affected by our society's racist practices? Systemic racism. <laughs> Just look at the population. You mentioned numbers in the beginning. If you look at the difference between black, brown, white, yellow people who are incarcerated, when white people, all due respect, you got to be feeling uncomfortable now. It's, Go for it. But the, 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 but the numbers speak for themselves. You're talking about evidence-based. Evidence is clear that even though there are more white people in this country, there are less white people that are being convicted than a black person for the same crime. And for that same crime, a black person or brown person or yellow person is getting a sentence that's so far like crazy. And then they'll make excuses for a white person particularly one who has affluent people, family members. I hate to mention a guy that has like red hair and it was red, it's turning a little blonde. He was recently indicted and shrugged off. He's still going to run for president. <laughs> and a guy that was actually helping him, the guy in his campaign that was championing his ideas, he too got arrested, black guy. Guess what? No one raised money for him to get out of prison. He's still sitting in prison. And they're on the same team, mind you. Once inside prison, is there a disparity in treatment? To be honest with you, in my experience, white guys get it a little bit more worse than white officers because they think that you're white. You shouldn't be in here. What is your problem? So they may have a little harder time than the black guy who they think should be in here as opposed to the white guy you shouldn't be here so we're going to make it a little harder on you so the disparity there in that place black guys is going to get treated like crap regardless the white guy is held to a standard wherein you shouldn't be here you mocked our race you made us look bad as a people that kind of thing do guys talk about this not in groups <laughs> Not in groups that are set up by the institution, but when we sit down at the table and things of that nature, we have our fireside chat about certain things <laughs> because you see it is prevalent. Gentlemen, how is your work different communicating with an incarcerated person who will be reentering society in the near term and one who will be in prison for life? We work with a lot of people serving life without parole in Pennsylvania. Number one, we believe reentry starts on day one when they get in. So we don't really care whether they're getting out next week or potentially never. And we also believe there's always a chance that they will get out. There's commutation processes. There's laws that change. Preparing for getting out is important. Number two... Our focus is on how do we thrive in whatever community we're in. So the prison is a working society in there. And the people serving life without parole are generally the pillars of that community. They are the leaders and they are the ones people coming in look up to and who have the authority. So if we can influence them to help them thrive and help their community thrive, we are helping everyone. As part of that, we want the community in prison to be a thriving one. If it thrives in there, they will thrive when they get out. So learning to serve one another, learning to care for other people, learning to respect others inside that you don't have to live in fear. And how do we build real relationships? All that can be learned and done inside. And if it's done in there, people are prepared when they get out. We don't view somebody serving on their first day of a life without parole sentence at age 25. We don't view them any different 
than somebody who's going to get out in six months. They're human beings and they affect their communities. Guys that had that type of sentence have accepted, not in total, that this is their home. You don't want your home, I don't care where it is, to be in chaos. You want better for your home. A lot of these guys, unfortunately, have been sentenced to death by incarceration. This is where they're going to live. This is where they're going to be. And this is where they're, hopefully, I'm not going to say, I'm, I believe in power of words. I'm not going to accept that they're all going to die in prison. I'm going to say that they've been sentenced to death by incarceration. And it doesn't make it true that because like Jeff said, laws change, commutation. There are things in place that the person's recognize that he or she could possibly be released. Because this is where I was going to be. I always said temporary home. And no matter where you go, this is where you're setting your head to be your home. You want it to be comfortable. You want it to be safe. You want it. the same thing the person who lives in the community wants for their home to be or their neighborhood to be. So if Riff Raff is coming on the block. Yo, I got to be here, little bro. Don't. And there's still a hierarchy in place with the residents or the inmates. They're the pecking order. You know, when we first met you, you said that you respected your elders. The elders are respected. The elders are respected. If a guy has gray in his beard and stuff like that, he's respected. Knowing he been through this process and still standing strong, still has his wits about him and has accepted that although he's here, he doesn't treat people less than. He also is willing to help and give jewels wisdom, knowledge, how to navigate through this process. They're the gatekeepers of the prisons, the guys that have to be there. A lot of the tools and the environment that we're trying to create is um, just a practice space of trying to live these things out. Our tagline is unlocking human potential in America's prisons. And I think the thing with potential is limitless. Is that it's always a work in progress. We're all at different stages of what that looks like. We really try to cater what a lot of the tools and skills are and what does that look like, asking the question, what does that look like while inside and outside? The things we're bringing are intentionally applicable in both spaces, um, but if you're getting out, it's to practice those things while inside to go home, or if you're in, to just keep working on that, to keep tapping into your potential as you continue. So our role is to introduce the different tools and skills and create an environment that promotes a positive mindset that can be continued um, no matter what the environment is um, and sometimes in spite of the environment. One of the coolest classes I saw recently, our typical classes are video conference with two facilitators and eight to 10 individuals. And this one had about six or seven young men in their 20s or 30. And our academy assistants who've been through a course and additional training are live people supporting us as we do these classes. Four of them in the room when I was there, they were serving long sentence or life. And they were in their 50s and 60s. And it was really neat to see the interaction because the older men just sat back and listened and offered as little support as they could. But those young men were so aware of their elders in the room that you could just see the community working the way a community should. And those are the guys that are say, don't go to that shine a light thing. <laughs> or they'll say, yo, shine a light is the truth. The, the lifers, the guys serving long term sentences are the guys that we rely on to give the stamp of approval, to give validity to what the group is. You know, and the Bible speaks about the wise counsel at the gate. These are those guys at the gate where you go to and you speak to and, and they'll say, give you the download of what's going on in that place or that group or that whatever, or with the staff member, <laughs> that kind of thing. And these are the people that presumably are convicted for the worst crimes. Yeah. Or was the person that committed a bad crime? <laughs> yeah. 
it could have been an accomplice, mm. could have been just sitting in the car and you got a life sentence because during the commission of the crime, someone died, unfortunately. He was just a driver. But he got the same sentence that the person who pulled the trigger, if not more time, because the person who pulled the trigger, he's the one giving up all the tapes or telling. If the guy at the steering wheel, he's not saying anything. He's holding to the truth, the ethics and integrity of the underworld. And he's penalized for that. On both sides, there's a whole lot of myths and stuff that, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking that we're four guys sitting around a campfire talking about this whole situation. And I haven't asked the question and we may not be able to answer it fully, but what's it like for women? Is, is that something that we can even speak on? We, we don't have a representative among us who is a woman. We've done a lot of work in women's facilities and social structure wise, it's the same. As far as the long-termers are looked up to and respected. In a lot of cases, seen as the mother or grandmother that they may never have. I've often heard that said. There are some definitely some differences in how women and men respond to prison and interact. But the basic things we work on are very similar in women's facilities and men's facilities. We have one woman on our staff who did 37 years on a life without parole sentence. She was one of the first people that then Lieutenant Governor Fetterman was able to get her sentence commuted. So she's been on our staff for several years and does a great job of facilitating uh, with Travis and Dorman and with all the men and often gives us the female side of things. Our efforts to try to get some of our programs into women's facilities, and we're able to do that with our magazine, which is much more of a subscription model. And some of those facilities, we have almost 20%, if not more, um, who are subscribed to it. So they're accessing the content. Uh, and then we've tried to get some of our live courses uh, through video conference, but it seems like recently we haven't been able to get any going because there's a lot other programs happening. The, the capacity, they don't have time. Um, we haven't been able to get it going. I know Miss Naomi would say there's not enough. There could always be more. Um, but as far as being able to bring some other programs in from the outside, I think women's facilities will get to their capacity sooner than men's. Uh, Jeff, is there a moment in your work, an individual happening perhaps, which is most memorable to you? Oh, there's so many. One that I can think of was one of the first times I was in a women's state prison. We had switched from taking a large performing arts program of people from outside in and doing a show interacting all about building hope and we decided we're going to do that with incarcerated we went to a state women's prison it was the first time i met people serving life without parole we sat down with women to interview them to participate and i was shocked that these were such joyful people and we were laughing and having a great time this was not my notion of somebody serving life without parole and then I was interviewing a woman who I just wanted to come out and ask why are you here because she was she was just like somebody you'd meet in the store or in the lobby in the vestibule at church or something middle-aged a woman and so I did ask her what was your faith journey and she said I'm so blessed I served 22 years on death row and eight months ago, I received a life without parole sentence. God has been good to me. I just didn't know how to respond. <laughs> and then she proceeded to say to me, I see what town you're from. I'm from the next town over. And the light went on in my head that there had been a very high profile, horrible murder 25 years before that had been in the daily headlines. And it struck me, this is the person I'm talking to. And I remember thinking with the terrible situation of the crime, if anybody deserved the death penalty, it was that person 25 years ago. And now I'm sitting here talking to her, thinking, why is this person in prison? 
it took me a few months to process that and help me realize no matter what we do, we can change. Nobody is beyond hope and we're all human beings. Just how deep that really goes. That was one of many very memorable moments that were life-changing for me. My goodness. Dorman, have you had a situation or a moment that stays with you in particular? Well, I guess it would be more personal. Of course, every group that I participated with the guys does something to me or for me. It increases my hope for the future of society because a lot of those guys are coming home a lot better than what they went in. So that's always a great thing. But when Jeff asked me to come work for him in my personal life, I include Jeff as one of my heroes right up there with my mom and the things that he's allowed me to do through this organization and the platform he's allowed me to have and advocating for the men in prison and sending me to go work with and for a staff member that was an administrative staff person while I was on the inside and work shoulder to shoulder with this person now as peers. And she told me, like you did, Bob, call me by my first name. And she seen me as an equal. So my personal story has impacted me the most. And I'm trying not to be selfish with that because it's so many great stories. And just to pinpoint one, I would be doing a disservice to the rest of those guys. Because they all come out so much better than what they came in. And then you have some guys who don't complete the course the first time or the second time, but they haven't given up on the hope that they want that change and know that the group is good for them. And they come back a third time and we allow them in and they complete it. That's crazy. Or a guy who I, I encourage to write this gratitude letter to your family member and they do it even when the session is over, when the foundation's course is over. And they send word to me that I took your advice. I wrote that letter. And now me and my family member are bonding again. What? You didn't have to do that after we parted ways. And then the tell the staff member or the champion, let Dorman know I wrote that letter because of him. What? I inspired you? And then they tell me I inspired them to be better. And they know that it's because you always hear about the guys that come back. You always hear about the guys that mess up. You rarely hear about the guys that are doing well out here and doing the right thing. And whatever success it is for them, succeeding. And a possibility that, that I could be you sitting on the other side of this camera. I can't limit it to just one. But if I had to, it would be my own story and how I met Jeff and how I feel about Jeff and my little brother, Travis. Yeah. And meeting you, Bob. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Jeff. I wouldn't be here. And although you have the beautiful hearth and fireplace and Travis has his back cave and Jeff has beautiful piano and stuff. And I have my family. I'm here. I'm here. I'm present. That's everything to me, man. That's everything to me. In the beginning, I didn't think it was possible. You're so far from the end of the tunnel of light that you didn't see light. Not knowing what tomorrow held. Yet press forward, keep striving and get better, be better. It's possible. Travis, what's it like working with these guys? We have a really unique staff in a diversity of perspective, thought and experience that comes to the table. Um, which is, I think, really a strength of our organization. We definitely challenge ourselves. We're also all a work in progress. We're practicing outside of our sessions all the time and trying to figure that out and trying to encourage one another. I think working with my dad is is an experience in many good ways. Uh, there's a level of honesty I think we can have with one another, which can get us in trouble, but I think it also then draws us to push one another, which I think is really cool. And then Dorman, getting to work with him, he, he has a zest for life of seeing things through and wanting to do them really well. And I think that comes through in everything he's doing in figuring out technology, which advanced 
during his incarceration and being able to be using a mic on a Zoom and doing that all on his own. Um, and this isn't even Zoom, this is a different thing. That's just like a very small example of how I think Dorman approaches life. I'm inspired by that and keep pushing always uh, to hold that hope. Thanks, Travis. Of course. So Travis, wh where do you see yourself in 20 years? Oh, that's a good question. That's something I've been thinking a lot about recently. Working in this field of positive psychology has so many different spaces to apply it. It's, it's relatively new and the number of studies coming out showing how intentional effort to make positive changes in one's life is applicable in so many ways for a variety of outcomes too. So like in this setting, we're really trying to promote having positive mindsets, tools and skills that allow for positive relational growth and environments and the result of that is people being able to be more productive at work people being able to have stronger relationships and meaningful relationships being able to have more confidence being able to have all kinds of different ways to intentionally apply those to meet their potential when i think of what does 20 years from now look like the continued application of this in different spaces and especially in areas that aren't going to have access to it first, I think is really important. That's something that I really care about and want to continue working on in different capacities. So whether that's in correctional settings or in an education, there's a lot of people applying this field. How do you really draw that out of students, especially young kids, to boost that confidence to be successful in school and all of those things? But I think that access is huge because the people who are going to have access to be able to understand this field and apply it in meaningful ways and integrate it in meaningful ways. And I think it's going to be easy for people at the top to get access to it first. So how do we allow that to be um, accessible to more people? And I think that's what I really care about in doing that in different spaces, I think is really important for our community to move together and move forward together. Dorman, a lot of times I'm always fascinated with asking people that have been around for a while if you met your 20-year-old self, what advice would you give him? But I feel also I should leave that question open to you if you want to talk about 20 years hence. To me, to take away a person's choices and options is prison. I would tell my young self, make the best decisions for yourself. Time is my most prized commodity. You can be rich. You can go flat broke in a week. And then next week you can get that money back. With your time, once it's spent, spend it wisely. Love your family. Be present for your family. They need you. They're going to need you. You don't know what the road may carry, but be there on the road. So I would think I would say something along those lines. Choose. It's up to you. It's almost like the Matrix. I get this blue pill and this red pill. <laughs> choose. It's your choice. In 20 years, I hope to be off of parole. <laughs> but free. But free. Seeing my children, my grandchildren now, become adults, young adults. And they're having an influence on that. Where I didn't have that. Now my son's in prison right now. My son's in prison. My son was my cellmate for a year and a half. Probably one of the toughest experiences I ever had in my life. But to be able to influence these young people, young kids on the street, in my community, to tell them about, yes, you have a choice. Make a good choice for yourself in your future. Don't believe what society says about, they dictate everything. Choose what success is for you. Jeff, I don't know how we follow your colleagues, but I wanted to ask you the same question. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're a tough act to follow all the way around. I really hope we can capture the support to take this a lot further. Our organization, Shining Light, has been going into prison since 1999, working a bit under the surface, kind of outside the boxes, outside the lines. And... It was a real growing learning process of constantly asking what works. 
Then the pandemic really hit the reset button. It was about the time we had discovered positive psychology and realized we are doing that. And here's all this research that says what we're doing is going to work. And we can even refine it further with that. And then we brought formerly incarcerated individuals on our staff. Their insight and wisdom into here's what's not working and here's how to make something work to help people in prison reach their potential. I'm hoping somewhere in the next five to 10 years, we can find some real support to take this a whole lot further. And I'm not quite sure where I fit into that as I get older and older. <laughs> Depends some of the pace. I will be definitely rooting for it to happen and doing all I can to see that happen. And all the other things about supporting family. I've learned so much through this. 30 years ago, I would have said, lock them up, throw away the key. What are you bothering with going into prison for? A human being has just grown so much for me. I hope to share that with others, whether it's just within family or far beyond. Gentlemen, Jeff, Dorman, Travis, thank you so much for this conversation and for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And it's hard for me to sign off without thinking about a meeting again sometime and talking about where you're at. But thanks so much. It's been really wonderful. And thank you, Bob. We've really enjoyed the conversation and yeah, enjoyed having other people interested in this kind of behind the scenes part of society. Thanks. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate your questions and take care. Yeah. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Where the Twain Meet. And please check out future programming at our website, wherethetwainmeet.com. <laughs>